Welcome to Natu Reads, an audio library of revolutionary texts. Our Road by the Poor Peasants League. We vow, on the blood spilled of our comrades on the Santa Elena farm, to carry the struggle for land, for democracy, justice, and work to its final victory at any cost. Oath taken by the resistors of the Battle of Santa Elena at the founding of the MCC in Jaru, Hondonia, February 25, 1996, signed by the continuators of the Santa Elena struggle and founders of the Poor Peasants League. Presentation Dear Companions, Our road first appeared 22 years ago, in mid-1996. It contained the summary of the studies and ideas resulting from the social practice, mainly in class struggle, of hundreds of militant revolutionary companions and companions from the popular masses from different regions of our country. Its purpose was to serve as a basic orientation for intervention in the peasant movement in the struggle for the conquest of land and for the transformations necessary for the social and political liberation of the poor people of the countryside in particular, and for the liberation of the Brazilian people and our nation from the yoke of imperialism in general. Under the impact of the dramatic events of August 9, 1995, in Corumbiara, Rondonha, where thousands of peasants camped in Santa Elena Farm, imposed the fiercest resistance to the savagery of the latifundium and its old bureaucratic genocidal state and its cowardly act of sowing terror and eviction of more than 600 families, the peasant movement of our country entered a new stage of its history. Those events deeply marked the history of the popular movement in the state of Hondonia and in our country, also deeply demarcating the field between the various political currents in the popular movement and in Brazilian society. With them began an open struggle inside the peasant movement about the direction, political line, and methods of organization and struggle. In fact, it started a necessary and inevitable process of separation and purging for the peasant movement of its two-line struggle, between the proletarian or the bourgeois line, the democratic or the bureaucratic line, and its long and complex course in our country. This struggle is the one between the road of opportunism which is the same bureaucratic road of the bourgeoisie and the landlords who have always subordinated the peasant movement to electoral projects, treating the peasants as a secondary class in the class struggle, and the revolutionary road, the only one capable of effectively conquering the land through the complete destruction of the latifundium, because it is guided by the revolutionary program of transformations for the countryside, considering the poor peasants as the main force for the revolutionary democratic transformations of our country, based on the Worker-Peasant Alliance. Since the heroic Battle of Santa Elena, throughout 20 years, the experience of the popular struggle in our country has only confirmed the analysis and orientation of our road. It has also presented important challenges that have required new responses to new problems, imposing on us the need to revise and adjust aspects of our orientation, as has occurred throughout the 13 and a half years of management by the opportunist PT Pesedube, PSB, PDT parties, supported by the rest of the so-called, quote, electoral left, end quote, by CONTAG, MST, the central unions, and other organizations controlled by opportunism. With the electoral triumph of Luis Inácio in 2002, the opportunist leaderships, although increasingly decadent, have still prevailed in the peasant movement, have had every opportunity to demonstrate and prove who their theses really serve, the big bourgeoisie, the landlords, and imperialism, but not the poor peasants. Let's see. Here we are after 13 and a half years of their governments, Luis Ignacio and Gilma, in truth a mere shift in the administration of this old, bureaucratic landlord, imperialist servant state, that ended in its most complete failure, sunk in the economic and general crisis of decomposition of bureaucratic capitalism and amidst the general crisis of imperialism. Furthermore, the serious political crisis that ousted Gilma Josefi by impeachment 
is an expression of the contention between the factions of the ruling classes due to this same economic crisis. In all these years, the poor peasants can only say that their situation got worse. Was it not Luis Ignacio who said, among so many campaign promises, that, quote, if he had to take only one measure in his government, it would be agrarian reform, end quote? Yes, it was him. Was it not the opportunists who gained, no less, control of the Ministry of Agrarian Development? And were it not the cadres linked to the national leadership of the MST and CONTAG, who occupied the most important positions in INCRA at the national and state levels? Yes, they did. And what has all this been for? For the poor peasants to see the failure of the usual old, quote, government land reform, end quote, drivel. This has served to unmask all of the opportunists, shameless electioneers that they are, and this entire government, which has revealed itself to be nothing more than a shift in the administration of this old bureaucratic landlord, imperialist servant state. The only thing left to the peasant movement is to carry on the struggle for a genuine agrarian revolution. But for this, it is necessary to reject the rotten opportunist road of conciliation, taking the thorny, difficult revolutionary road of the struggle for the complete destruction of the latifundium. And it is to wage this struggle and to give a great impulse to the peasant movement that our path has been born, always new, invariable, reinvigorated, and incontrovertible. Revision and Editorial Committee Goiano, June 2018 for an agrarian program of radical transformation of the countryside. 1. Introduction The agrarian peasant question in Brazil, contrary to the relegation of its meaning by reactionaries, bourgeois academics, the press monopolies, and opportunists of different affiliations, continues to be central, of fundamental importance for the solution of the great national problems, and is the basis for achieving a true democracy. It is not by chance that the struggle for land has never stopped and has been growing in the last decades, to the point that the dominant classes themselves have had to make it a central point in their government policies. And of course, not to change anything in relation to their structure, but as an attempt to paralyze the growing and militant peasant movement. The general economic social crisis of the capitalist system, with the advance of financial capital in the countryside, has and is provoking the most brutal expulsion of millions of people from their land through the grabbing of these lands for the mega-projects of primary production for export. Sugarcane, soy, coffee, as well as cattle, homogeneous forests, and the unbridled expansion of mining. To the masses of landless poor peasants, or poor peasants with little land, are added the indigenous peoples, the remnants of quilombolas, Tens of millions of people harassed by the concentration of land in the hands of a tiny minority of landlords and transnational corporations by servile labor and by the lack of any government support and initiative. This situation is further aggravated by the continued application of quote, adjustment and quote policies and liberalizations to the free action of foreign capital demanded by the empire, deepening class contradictions in the countryside, causing an explosion of mobilizations occupations and land seizures confronted by the persecution of the judiciary system, with the most brutal repression by the police and military forces of the state, attacks by gunmen and paramilitary gangs, and prohibitive environmental laws. In the face of this, the poor peasants respond in a more organized way, emerging as the most dynamic and driving factor in the popular struggle. For the big bourgeoisie and the different landowning sectors, the change in the land ownership structure in the country is unacceptable, since it's a determining factor as an underpinning of imperialism and reproducing the bureaucratic capitalism that it drives in the country. Thus, as it has always been, the ruling classes continue to use all forms of violence to prevent any reform, even the most superficial, combining the legal and police military action of the old state with that of the gangs of gunmen and paramilitaries in the repression selective assassinations, and mass massacres. In the last 22 years, more than 2,000 people, including peasants, lawyers, and clerics, were murdered in the countryside. Four savage massacres, Corumbiara, 1995, and El Dorado dos Carajás, 1996, Colniza Mato Grosso, 2016, 
and Pau d'Arc au Pará, 2017, are the most dramatic demonstration of the weight the land question has and the centrality of the contradiction between poor peasants and landlords in the class struggle in our society. Currently, after 13 and a half years of opportunist management, electoral front headed by the PT, PSDB, PSB, etc., the application of, quote, neoliberal, end quote, policies dictated by imperialism has deepened, particularly in the sense of strengthening the country in its condition as a producer of primary goods for export, raw food in Natura. This has led to an increase in land values through the increasing hoarding of large tracts of land for this production, either by dispossessing small proprietors of their land or through the massive and free incorporation of public lands, from 2003 to 2015, more than 150 million hectares of public lands were donated to big landowners through, quote, terre legale, and quote, legal land, translators note, meaning a colossal reinforcement and strengthening of the old landowning class. In addition, and as a direct result, the already timid agrarian reform program was completely paralyzed. Repression against the militant peasant movement increased, and a latifundist offensive was unleashed through the judiciary with waves of evictions and reviews of, quote, settlement, end quote, decisions, and campaigns of defamation of the peasant struggle by the bourgeois press. In a single sentence, the agrarian reform policy of the opportunist administration was reduced solely to repression of the militant peasant movement, besides facilitating projects and transactions of the state with MST and CONTAG. With the serious political crisis that deposed Gilma Rousseff by impeachment, expression of contention among the fractions of the ruling class due to the same economic crisis, and with the inauguration of the bandit Temer, together with the continuation of the reactionary offensive in the countryside, the offensive against workers and other salaried workers has been unleashed, with cuts and rights that were hard won in years of hard struggle by the proletariat, with the approval of Congress of the, quote, labor reform, end quote, in preparation for the approval of the, quote, pension reform, end quote, besides all kinds of attacks against free public education and other rights of the people. The impeachment of Gilma and the inauguration of Temer was the reaction of the official political world against the, quote, Operation Lava Jato, end quote, Operation Car Wash, moved by the guardians of this old state, who through the public ministry intended to clean up the facade of the other institutions in the political system demoralized, and increasingly without any legitimacy before the masses of people. All in an attempt to save the old order from its general collapse, deflecting the hatred of the masses against this whole system of exploitation and oppression, instigating them against corruption, as if mere corruption were the main cause of so much injustice, abuse, misery, and abandonment suffered by the masses, as well as the plundering and subjugation of the nation. The crisis has only deepened. And the massacres, slaughters, imprisonments, and brutal repression against the masses and the struggle for land and a defense of their trampled rights in the countryside and in the city do not stop, because the electoral farce has been completely unmasked, and there is no other path for the people than the increasingly bloody struggle. The popular masses must consciously prepare their inevitable rebellion. Faced with the crisis, division of the ruling classes, and the growing revolt of the masses, the armed wing of the old state, the reactionary armed forces, have already set in motion a preventative counter-revolutionary military coup in anticipation of this rebellion. The masses of our people in general, and the peasants and the struggle for the land in particular, are facing a great challenge. To furnish the answers to this question, in the daily struggle for the conquest of land, we understand that it is extremely necessary that the class-conscious trade union movement, together with the militant peasant movement, have a deep consciousness of this reality, in order to establish and develop the deepest and most solid worker-peasant alliance, a determining force to achieve the great pending transformations, beginning with the agrarian question that the impoverished masses and our homeland demand and need. For this, it is necessary to examine the historical reality of our country, starting from its social-economic formation, in which the land problem occupies a central and decisive role in order to substantiate and formulate an authentic agrarian program that starts from the need to completely break the old relations of land ownership that have existed for centuries in our country and have never changed, but have always been reinforced and reproduced. 2. 
the society we live in. Capitalism is a system based on the exploitation of man by man. Capitalist societies divided into antagonistic classes with irreconcilable interests. Fundamentally, the exploiting class, the bourgeoisie, owner of the banks, factories, companies, land, the large landowners, latifundium, who accumulate their wealth by exploiting the labor of the exploited class, the worker or proletariat. The capitalist system is one that completely dominates the world today, and it is not capitalism in general. It is monopoly capitalism as a world system, i.e. imperialism. And the capitalism that developed in our country was the one that imperialism, mainly British initially and then mainly US imperialism, imposed upon the semi-colonial condition of the country and supported by its semi-feudal base, bureaucratic capitalism. These were important particular conditions that determined the backwardness and conservation of totally archaic and retrograde structures in the country's economic, social, political, and cultural life, in force for more than a century until today. From the end of the 19th century, 1890 to 1900, capitalism passed to its monopolist stage. It ceased to be a regime based on free competition and became a monopoly regime transforming itself into a single imperialist international system. As a result of this, the world was divided into oppressor and oppressed nations, and was divided among the great powers. Thus, the development of capitalism in Brazil is supported on a semi-feudal base and has always been submitted to imperialism, monopolistic capitalism, under the condition of a semi-colony, firstly by the British and after World War II, mainly by US imperialism. Capitalism emerged in our country in the second half of the 19th century, and grew more from the beginning of the 20th century, from 1901 on. Thus, capitalism appeared in Brazil in a period when it was already in its monopolistic phase, that is, the imperialist phase. It was introduced here by British imperialism, mainly in alliance with the big landlords, their rural landowning oligarchies, and big local importers, commercial and comprador bourgeoisie. Such origin and development never radically changed, and determined that, no matter how much in the course of a century capitalism has developed, Brazil continues to be a backward country, submitted to foreign domination and millions of our people living in misery, ill and illiterate. Thus, even though capitalism has developed, it has not led to even a minimal democratization of land ownership, as has occurred in the imperialist countries, United States, Canada, Germany, England, France, Japan, etc. On the contrary, the development of capitalism in Brazil only accentuated the monopoly and concentration of land ownership, as well as the backward relations that originate and reproduce it, even if many times in an underlying way, through the evolution of its forms. Backward, our society is divided not only into the bourgeoisie and proletariat, there is also the class of landlords, latifundium, owners of large extensions of thousands and even tens of thousands of hectares, large estates of unproductive and productive types, the so-called agribusiness, that exploit and oppress poor peasants. There are also middle sectors that are classes of medium and small owners, industrialists, merchants, and farmers, that make up the middle and small bourgeoisie, also oppressed by the local big bourgeoisie and imperialism. Moreover, there are other exploited classes made up of private and public sector employees, commerce and service workers, and others like street vendors. For this reason, the land question in Brazil is deeply related not only to the formation of social classes, but has determined the type of bureaucratic, semi-feudal, genocidal, and corrupt state necessary for the maintenance of power in the hands of the landlords and big bourgeoisie, lackeys, and at the service of imperialism. Following their arrival, the Portuguese took possession of the lands, and for this, they massacred the indigenous nations. Later, the king of Portugal distributed the lands to his friends and protégés through Sesmarias, large extensions of land. Immediately, the Portuguese crown prohibited the poor from owning unoccupied land, and in 1850, with the land law, quote, Lei da Terra, end quote, the state instituted that land ownership would be recognized only through its purchase in anticipation of the situation that was already emerging with the inevitable abolition of slavery 
and the increasing influx of poor immigrants into the country. Over the years, a population of poor peasants was formed, who were exploited by the big landlords, working as colonists, aggregates, partners and sharecroppers, etc., along with the enslavement of black people, who for more than 300 years were brought from Africa, and who formed a system of servitude destined exclusively to supply the European metropolises. With the abolition of slavery in 1888, a great mass of a few million landless peasants emerged, the ex-slaves, and poor immigrants, unwanted in their countries and pushed out to Brazil. A large part of this contingent wandered into the deep expanses of land and settled as squatters, and part of the immigrants were absorbed into colony systems, mainly into the coffee culture. Thus, the struggle for land in Brazil became an acute contradiction between poor peasants and the latifundium, and consequently with its state. The peasant aspires to conquer the land in order to be able to make a living from it, and never again need to sell, even for a day, his labor force to a landlord. The large estates, and the bourgeoisie in general, are interested in the concentration of land and the failure of small production, expelling peasants from the land, generating an abundant labor force to be exploited in their interests, and a large and permanent mass of unemployed. These reactionary classes are also interested in the existence, at a certain level, of a mass that lives off the peasant economy, capable of supplying the internal market with basic necessities, food, raw materials, and small artisan utensils, in a form totally subjected and exploited by capital that condemns it to a permanently ruined existence. This is a reality that has never changed qualitatively. In the last five decades, mainly, the growing mechanized exploitation of large extensions of land, the use of high technology, improved seeds, intensive use of fertilizers and pesticides, left the small producer, mostly integrated to the market, totally unable to compete with the big producers, composed more and more of monopolies. Lower and middle peasants cannot survive in a country dominated by monopolies like Brazil, except in constant ruin. All small and middle property is submitted to the spoliation of finance capital. The bourgeois landlord system protects big capital and the latifundium, systematically massacring small and medium property and exploiting and plundering to the extreme the proletariat and the popular masses among them the poor landless peasantry. For this reason, besides the conquest of the land that destroys the latifundium, it is fundamental to organize small production in associative forms to make it minimally viable as an economy of resistance. Organizing cooperatives, collective groups for mutual aid, or any other form of joint work is fundamental, so that the peasant does not give up the conquered land, and so that it does not return to the hands of the latifundium and so that it serves as a point of support for sustaining and continuing the struggle. The tasks that correspond to the necessary and urgent radical transformations in the countryside cannot be accomplished by any governments emerging within the current order. It can only be the work of the peasant movement itself, organized in its objective and in alliance with the urban and rural proletariat. Such programmatic tasks imply a protracted struggle to seize the land, distribute it to the poor landless or nearly landless peasants, to liberate the productive forces by organizing production in a collective way based on the association of the plots at various levels of cooperation, and to organize the exercise of political power in the areas taken over and around them, villages and small towns, making these victories new points of support to continue striking against the latifundium, and this whole system of hunger, misery, and exploitation sustained by the state. Keeping the nationalization of the big rural capitalist enterprises and the, quote, nationalization of the land, end quote, itself in perspective, developing and strengthening the strategic alliance with the working class, broadening it with the other oppressed sectors of the people and the united front to seize the land from the latifundium, bit by bit, and to bring down the old bureaucratic landlord state, servile to imperialism, by improving the form of struggle that has most strengthened the land struggle, that of the peasant war to build the people's power of new democracy as the only possible way to achieve true agrarian transformation and conquer democracy, justice, land, and work. 3. The Land Struggle in Brazil At the end of the 1950s, several peasant organizations arose, mainly unions and the ULTAB, Union of Farmers and Agricultural Workers of Brazil, 
a result of a greater work of the Communist Party with the peasants. In the Northeast, mainly, but not only there, peasant leagues emerged, which organized tens of thousands of peasants to take over mills. The peasant leagues were the most important mass organizations of peasants in the struggle for land. Their growth placed the agrarian reform issue as a national question of first order, and radicalized the class struggle in the country with the slogan, quote, agrarian reform by law or by force, end quote. The big bourgeoisie, the latifundium, and U.S. imperialism felt seriously threatened by these, and organized the military coup of April 1, 1964, designed to destroy the popular organizations, mainly the peasant leagues, and to stop their growing reformist mass movement. In the struggle against the Yankee-backed military dictatorship, which protected the latifundium with iron and fire, many attempts were made at resistance and armed land struggle, as was the struggle in the countryside of Maragnon, in the Zona de Mata region, literally forest zone, in the sugarcane fields in the coastal states of the northeast, and in the Araguaia region, south of Pará. At the end of the 1970s, the struggle for land began to grow again, with the action of reformist sectors of the Catholic Church, pastoral land ministry, and other popular movements. In the early 1980s, the struggle for agrarian reform gained new impetus, and many rural workers' unions began to have militant leaderships. In the south of the country, the landless rural workers' movement emerged. The Land Struggle in Hondonia A New Chapter Of relatively recent colonization, Hondonia has its best lands in the hands of the Latifundia. Attracted by promises of fertile land and government aid, tens of thousands of peasant families migrated to that state. There, the great majority became cheap labor for the exploitation of the Latifundium landlords. The dream of conquering the land only really started to come true with the first land seizures that took place in that state. In all of them, they had to face the violence of the Latifundium through gangs of gunmen and police. The large number of poor, landless masses of peasants, abandoned to their fate, was met with an immediate and preventative reaction from the landlords, who had already been schooled to massacre indigenous villages in the south of Hondonia and the northwest of Mato Grosso, in order to take possession of their territories. Spontaneous land seizures were unleashed. With the violence and cowardice of the latifundium, using the police and their gangs of guachebas, gunmen employed by the large cattle ranches, Attempts were made to paralyze the land seizures. It was the aggressions, the cowardly murders, barbaric massacres, that forced the movement to advance in its organization and self-defense. In the face of the increasing violence of the latifundium and the government, the defense of the masses of peasants in the land seizures and camps demanded a greater mobilization, organization, combativeness, and courage from their leaderships. The radicalization of the land struggle caused a shift in positions in the peasant movement and consequently its division in Hondonia. The leadership of the MST in that state began to have a vacillating and police-like attitude, and the PT allied itself with the PMDB government of Algia Haupi, today a senator, trying to isolate the most militant comrades and adopting a conciliatory attitude in the land struggle. These comrades, who corresponded to the aspirations of the masses, one by one, broke away from the vacillating leadership and joined together in preparing the historic takeover of the Santa Elena farm in Carumbiara. The Battle of Santa Elena The southern region of Hondonia has the best and healthiest land of the state. Most of them unproductive, they were, and still are, the best alternative for the 40,000 poor peasant families in the region. In the 1980s and early 1990s, the victorious takeovers of Vergi Seringo, Victoria da Unión, and Adriana had already occurred. To continue confronting the latifundium, headed by retired army colonel Antenor Duachi, who with his gunmen spread terror trying to intimidate the masses and their leaders, required courage and combativeness. This is what a group of comrades demonstrated when they began mobilizing and organizing more than 600 families to take over a large estate, the 18,000 hectare Santa Elena farm in the municipality of Corumbiara. When invited to contribute to the occupation, the MST leadership of Hondonia not only refused, 
but also informed the state government of the names of comrades who would be leading the mobilization. Already at this time, the PT had made a deal with the PMDB and was participating in the government of Valgia Haupi. This betrayal was the password for the landowners to plan, together with the state government, the barbaric massacre that took place in the early hours of August 9, 1995. The result? 16 dead, 7 disappeared, more than 200 comrades with serious consequences resulting from the savagery unleashed by the police, and several persecuted comrades. The number of victims was not higher because the peasants organized the resistance with the weapons they had. Sticks, scythes, and hunting rifles. The massacre was an intentionally prepared action, with military planning, with the objective of spreading terror among the peasant families and thus paralyzing the land seizures of the Latifundia in Hondonia and in the country. However, contrary to what was expected, the bloody repression generated enormous solidarity and made the hatred of the masses explode raising a wave of new land seizures throughout Brazil. The opportunists and conciliators of the MST leadership in Rondonia were completely unmasked, and the comrades who led that struggle now have the responsibility of continuing the struggle against the latifundium in the state, honoring the generous blood of those comrades who died in the struggle for land. A few months later, another defeat for the opportunists. Victory for the opposition for the Federgro Board of Directors, with the election of comrades who supported the struggle in Santa Elena, defeating the situation, supported by the MST board. The struggle opened by the Battle of Santa Elena, in a general way, demarcated two paths in the Brazilian peasant movement, and, in this sense, became a fundamental milestone in the history of the peasant movement, especially in its most recent phase. This split within the peasant movement continued to deepen, not as a weakening of the movement, but on the contrary, as the possibility of development of an authentic and combative peasant movement. From the Santa Elena struggle emerged the MCC, Peasant Movement Corumbiara, with the purpose of continuing to support the legacy of the Santa Elena struggle. With time, the struggle became established within the MCC itself, giving way to the purification process that began with the Battle of Santa Elena. From the fight within the MCC itself, against the influence of opportunism, poured mainly by the Petism and the Catholic Church, and for the deepening of the combative peasant movement that was advancing in the north of Minas, the Poor Peasants League arose. With the emergence of the Poor Peasants League and their multiplication in other regions of the country, the peasant movement entered a new phase, that of playing its historical role as the main force in the democratic revolution that is being stalled in the country. The level of organization and the methods of struggle gained new contours under the banner of quote, conquer the land, end quote, and quote, destroy the latifundium, end quote. New and more massive battles are being fought by the peasant movement, which is facing a greater intensification of juridical, political repression by the old state, of paramilitary action by the landlords, and of defamation campaigns by the bourgeois press. Also, the struggle between the two roads, that of opportunism and the bourgeoisie with their drip, 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 quote, agrarian reform, end quote, and that of following the path of revolutionary struggle for the destruction of all the latifundium, has moved to a more advanced level that puts the complete unmasking of all opportunism in the peasant movement, represented principally by the leadership of the MST, by Contag, and its structure of state federations and assistentialist unions on the short and medium term. And this is the main aspect of the militant peasant movement, that continues to develop and seeks to orient itself by a revolutionary program of agrarian transformation, a program that combats the influences of the bourgeoisie and opportunism, and that includes the Worker-Peasant Alliance. In short, a program in which the proletariat, objectively supporting the struggle of poor peasants for the destruction of the latifundium, is the basis for profound transformations, not only in the countryside, but in all of Brazilian society.